Hi. Today we're going to be talking about thorax and lungs, and if you'll look in your Jarvis, it's chapter 18. So pull out your uh, textbook, and you can also um, go along with the PowerPoints that we put on D2L. So thorax and lungs, um, as you can see from most of the PowerPoints, we always go over, you know, the kind of review anatomy. Um, so the first few pages of your chapter review landmarks um, of the thorax cavity. Uh, or thoracic cage. So you can see that you have anterior landmarks. Um, in your book it kind of goes over those on page 412, but anterior landmarks would be your suprasternal notch, which is of course the, the notch that is um, above the sternum, and then you also have the sternum itself, um, and then the costal angle, which the costal angle, if you look in your book at that, at that wonderful page, and I think there's a, um, this next slide actually shows it, um, you'll see that the costal ang angle is the angle from the xiphoid process down, that's the bottom, a kind of a V point, a, a, a inverse V that goes at the lower part of the rib cage. It's kind of nice to know the landmarks so you'll know where you're putting your stethoscope and how a chest should look. Uh, the posterior landmarks would be, and here's a picture of it, your um, posterior is going to be your vertebrae, especially the C7, and so the cervical 7 is like a spiny process. You can count down the cervix, uh, the cervical spine, excuse me. You also can see that the scapula are in there, and then you also have um, the 12th rib, and sometimes it's hard to really count that, but those are the pretty much the back or the posterior landmarks. Um, you also have what we call reference lines, so when we're talking about how to uh, put in your data or your documentation, look on page 413 with me in your Jarvis, if, it's your, if you've got the new version. You can see that there's a picture of lines, and that's, you also have a slide. It shows the mid-sternal line, which is down center of the chest, Mid-clavicular line, I use that term a lot trying to determine where certain structures are. But you look at the clavicle, which is across, and of course, you know, here's our, our model here too. But the clavicle, mid-clavicular line would be the center of that and then downward and the slope. And then the anterior axillary line, that would be the axilla, of course, or the axilla is underneath the arm. So that would be the anterior axillary line. Posterior, you also have a couple of references, ver vertebral line, which is the line um, up and down the back, and then also the scapular line, so the mid of the scapular. Looking um, once again at your, post your uh, PowerPoint, you'll see that there. Because we also want to reference where we're listening to other lung sounds, you'll see that there is also a lateral um, lines as well. And the mid-axillary line um, is one that we use pretty often because we have on the right side, we have, of course, on the right side of the lungs, there's three lobes. So we listen for the um, right, we, we listen for that middle lobe under that right arm, mid-axillary, about the fifth intercostal space. So that's something to keep in mind, and this is showing you actually the opposite side. It's showing you a, a left arm, but it is on the right where you will be doing that. Uh, some other things just to look at to review would be the thoracic cavity. Um, and as I said, that you have different lobes of the lungs. Sometimes we'll talk about anterior, uh, listening anteriorly, posteriorly, and then your lateral. Um, and then, of course, you should review the anatomy of your trachea and your bronchial tree and the terms that are used for that. Remember, the um, right side has uh, three lobes, the left side has two lobes in the lungs. You can also see a little bit of anatomy. There's a picture um, in your book about the internal structures. It shows that we also have um, the respiratory tract includes uh, the trachea, of course, all the way down into the lobes of the lungs, and then it, it kind of shows where they um, bifurcate. And a, a close-up picture in your slide about the bronchioles and, of course, the bottom of the, the alveolar sac, which is consisting of your, um, your, 
your alveoli is where O2 and CO2 is exchanged. So in order for you to understand how to do on a health exam or assessment of the thorax and lungs, you have to understand the, the terminology and, and the anatomy and physiology. Um, it does review with you in your, on your slides about uh, the functions of the respiratory system and, and how you know, those things are controlled. So I will let you review those mechanisms and the mechanisms of respiration are on page 416, um, but pretty much just talking about we, we, how our lungs are to remove CO2 or carbon dioxide. We also have them to maintain acid-base balance or homeostatic balance of the blood, arterial blood. Uh, we also, our lungs are also um, to maintain heat exchange and, and probably the first thing we think of is of course to provide oxygen for the body for energy production. So please look at page 416 and those mechanisms as you're looking at it. We um, know that the chest wall configuration, the size of it, generally when we're looking at a configuration of a chest wall, we're looking at the size from the front to the back is called anterior to posterior, and then across the chest wall is called the transverse. So when you're doing an exam, you want to look at is the anterior to posterior chest wall, the size of it, less than transverse, which is of course the chest wall across between the arms, or is it equal to or greater than? So what would that be? If it were equal to or greater than, then that is a sign of a um, barrel chest, perhaps someone that's had uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease known as COPD, um, or maybe uh, someone, an adult, that had cystic fibrosis as a child and now they're 20 years old and they have a barrel chest also. So long-term hypoxia, um, secretions, other things, other diseases can cause that. So after we've reviewed the anatomy and physiology and the mechanisms, we always start with subjective. You have, um, remember that for this course, you're not doing infants and children um, or the pregnant woman. So you can skip those sections. So we are basically looking at, there, there is a little bit about implications for the aging adult and also some cultural issues. Um, just to review a little bit about the aging adult, you will see that uh, respiratory muscle strength declines as a person becomes older and continues to decrease um, into the 70s. So between 50 and 70, you have some muscle strength decline um, and some less uh, elastic uh, elasticity within the lungs themselves. So they become less compliant. Um, it, so that can make a difference when you're thinking about uh, the depth of inspiration and also maybe some things like what would happen to someone if they've had anesthesia that's older, it might be harder for them to clear it. Um, there is something called decreased vital capacity in someone that's an elderly person. So that um, is the amount of air that a person can expel from their lungs after they've filled it to the maximum. So that means that that would be uh, decreased. They also, um, have increased residual volume, and that's the amount of air that's in their lungs. So the elderly client would have a decreased vital capacity, the ability to bring air in, but they have an increase of residual volume, which is left in their lungs. Um, they also talk about with aging, you eventually lose some of the number of alveoli, which can occur, which means you have less surface area for gas exchange, so that's another component of an aging person. This makes the elderly person more at risk for shortness of breath or dyspnea and something to think about as far as when you, again, you have them in the hospital and you're trying to make sure that they don't get pneumonia by changing positions, deep breathing, those kinds of things. Um, some of the cultural implications for respiratory would be that there has been um, more tuberculosis resistant tuber tuberculosis, we still have uh, tuberculosis as a problem in, in other countries and some, some folks are coming here that, that may have tuberculosis. But we know that wherever someone lives, like nursing homes, uh, prisons, in slow, uh, close 
proximity to each other, there is a resurgence of TB, and unfortunately, we're, we're seeing that it is drug resistant. We also know that asthma is a chronic condition that we're seeing um, happen in the U.S. and um, really greater risks for African Americans in inner city or children that are premature as infants. And I told you I wasn't gonna talk about children, but that's just sometimes childhood asthma can continue into adulthood. Let's see if there's anything else I wanna tell you about um, cultural implications. There, there are some differences in the size of the thoracic cavity based on culture. We see that, for instance, that um, a Chest volumes, uh, the largest, are found in Caucasian. And we also see that um, after that, then you'll see that, like for instance, American Indians are at the lower part. So looking over some cultural issues might be important when you're trying to determine, is this chest wall a normal size and what are some other capabilities as far as inspiration and expiration. So now we're ready to go into, we've done a little bit of review, and let's talk about some history questions you would ask anybody. This is my volunteer um, um, mannequin today, so I'll, I'll be showing some of the exam on the mannequin. But before I would do an exam, I would also want to go through some history questions, and you've got them listed on the PowerPoint. But I wanna know, if this person has a cough or not. So I'm gonna ask them about a cough. Do you have one? If they say yes, then I'm going to ask them, well, um, tell me about the cough. When do you have it? Um, is it at night, in the daytime? Is it productive? Uh, is there anything that makes it better? Anything that makes it worse? So all those things that you reviewed in chapter four about health history and those eight parameters, I would ask about this symptom of cough. Um, I would also know about the uh, quality of it. I mean, does it, like I said, is it productive or non-productive? And, and if it is productive, what is the color of it? Is it white? Is it red? Does it look like it has blood in it? Um, what is the cough? Tell me about the cough a little bit more. Is it a dry cough? Does it hurt your throat? Um, and, you know, again, what, have you tried any medicine with it? And, it? and has that medicine worked? So some of that things. And then I would ask the question about, do you, how has it affected your life if you've had this cough? So that's just one question. Another question that has to do with thorax and lungs would be shortness of breath. So I'm gonna ask the person, have you ever had shortness of breath? If I say yes, then I'm going to go on and say, well, tell me about your shortness of breath. What brings it on? How severe is it? And then the timing. Are you doing a particular activity when you have shortness of breath? Is it? because there's a difference. We know that the heart and the lungs are connected, and we know that when people are in heart failure, we can tell if they're short of breath all the time, that might be a, that would be more like left-sided heart failure versus if they're only short of breath when they walk, um, which is uh, dyspnea on exertion, DOE is sometimes how that's abbreviated. So tell me more about your shortness of breath. Is it daytime or nighttime? Um, is it related to allergies perhaps? And that would get into a history of environmental allergies. Um, what do you do when you have this shortness of breath? Are you on any medications, inhalers, um, any kind of special medications or oxygen? Um, have you learned how to do pursed lip breathing, which is breathing in through the nose and then slowly out through the lips? Um, those are some of the things I would ask them. Now, as I'm, as I'm going through this content with you, I just want to point out once again that the, you have to know what the normal norms are. And then on the right-hand column of Jarvis, there is a blue section that talks about the rationale, and it gives you other terms. So you should review those because that's often where we have test questions come from, would be knowing the norms of subjective information, which is your history, and then the abnormals. And the same way will be true for the objective exam. So for instance, let me back up once to the cough. There, are, there is a term under cough that's abnormal called hemoptysis. And hemoptysis, of course, is blood in the uh, sputum. Um, it also talks a little bit about what conditions may be characteristic of a cough. All right, so moving on to shortness of breath, there is a term that is called orthopnea. And orthopnea is when a person is short of breath when they're laying down. And so you wanna ask them, when you're laid down, 
how many pillows do you need to be able to rest comfortably that helps relieve your shortness of breath? So you state the number of pillows. You'd say two pillow orthopnea or three pillow orthopnea. What do they need? Um, I also, there's another term called paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, and that would be where they are asleep and then they're suddenly awakened with shortness of breath. And they also may have accompanying that shortness of breath diaphoresis or maybe cyanosis, which of course is um, um, a more critical sign. There are specific uh, shortness of breath that comes along with maybe asthma, and that's why we're asking them about allergies and, and, and that type of thing. All right, the third um, subjective or health history question I'm gonna ask my patient would be about chest pain because it's respiratory. We don't, respiratory and lungs kind of work together, but have they had any chest pain? Well, let's think about what can cause chest pain in a client with respiratory. Certainly, um, if they have infection, that can cause pain. If they have inflammation, that can cause pain. If they have infection like pneumonia and they've been coughing a lot, they could actually just have muscle pain from the, the coughing. So pain is a symptom. I'm gonna ask again about, you know, please point to the exact location. It could be that it's up here and it could be that would make it more like GERD or it could be lower at the bases. That could be pneumonia or it could be pleurisy where there's a little fluid and inflammation in the, in the sac around the, um, the lungs. You, and then you wanna ask them the timing of it. When did it start? How often do you get the chest pain? And when you get it, how long does it last? So that's the duration, that's the timing that it's talked about when you, when you go through that symptom of pain. Tell me exactly how it feels. Is it a sharp pain? Is it a stabbing pain? It, is it associated with breathing in, breathing out? So what is it associated with? I wanna know what you've done for it. Did you take any medicine for it? Did it help? Uh, does sitting up help? Does it hurt worse after eating? Because a lot of times with cardiac and respiratory symptoms, I have to rule out gastrointestinal uh, like uh, reflux and, and some other issues. Um, is, is there a fever associated? What am I thinking about with fever? Hmm. Well, with fever, it could be that it is an infection like pneumonia because with infection, especially bacterial infection, maybe some viral, we might have some fever. So it could be pneumonia, it could be bronchitis, it could be um, something else going on, but you sh you, you're not diagnosing, you're just kind of pulling the pieces together of this information. Uh, the next question specifically relates to a history of respiratory infections. And we know that the elderly can get respiratory infections pretty pretty uh, quickly because of what we talked about with the, the elderly. They have less compliance. Uh, they're more vulnerable to infection because of that. So do they have any issues with respiratory infections? Past trouble, bronchitis or emphysema, asthma or pneumonia, we gotta figure that out. And um, do they get colds often? So the, the respiratory system starts, of course, up at the nasal passages and goes all the way down the lungs. So we have to consider all of those symptoms. Do they get sinus infections? which can also be part of the, you know, even though that's the head, eyes, nose, and throat area, it can contribute to settling into the lungs and become infection. Um, I wanna know if they smoke. And so we know that with smoking affects every system of the body, especially the lungs, especially the heart. Um, it causes vasoconstriction, so the person's not gonna have as much airway exchange. It can build up tar and chemicals in the lungs. So if they say, yes, I smoke, when did you start? How many packs of day are you currently smoking and how long? Have you ever quit? Um, and then um, some of the activities associated with smoking. If not themselves smoking, do they have someone they live with? Because now we're seeing that passive smoke can also affect this person. Um, after we've talked about smoking, the sixth parameter we'll talk about is environmental exposure. Do, where do they work? Are, are these men or women that are working in factories that have chemicals or inhalants that could aggravate their lungs? Do they work in a coal mine? Do they work in construction where there may be a lot of dust? Do they work in a smoking area or smoky area? Uh, are they working with farming or uh, out in heavy congestion? So we know that 
um, farmers, particularly are at risk for grain inhalation and pesticide inhalation. So that's something to think about. Um, and so figure it out where these folks are from. And then we wanna know if it will, under environmental exposure, talk about self-care behaviors. Um, what would be a self-care behavior for respiratory? Hmm. Well, if they're going to be, if they're allergic to grass and alert, or, or they're working with chemicals, do they use any kind of mask? So a ventilary mask would be important. Um, I know someone that works, for instance, at the Toyota plant in Indiana, and he is spraying cars all the time, and he, they wear very protective equipment, not only on their skin, but particularly um, a heavy mask. He looks uh, like a Martian, uh, but it protects his lungs from those chemicals, and that spray paint can actually get into the lungs, the fine particles, and obstruct some of the airway. So that's an important thing. Um, some other self-care behaviors besides, you know, protecting themselves from dust and things would be, what about your your last um, examination? Did you um, do any kind of, first of all, no, pneumo, uh, pneumonia vaccine or influenza, which of course is recommended. Um, and also, when was the last TB skin test or chest x-ray that this person has, has gotten involved with? That would be a very thorough history. I also, additional history for the aging adult, um, once again, would be, it, it, have they noticed shortness of breath with their daily activities? I'm, con I'm concerned about, are we getting into some kind of heart issue with an elderly person and also if they've developed if they've been smoking long periods of time then do they have symptoms of COPD and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is a combination of both um, bronchitis and emphysema so do they have one do they have the other and how has that affected their life and if if also they have any chest pain with breathing um, so those are some things that I would want to know and I would want to know have they had a recent fall because if they fall then they could also have damaged um, a rib and a rib could have punctured a lung. So we're going to talk about that. I mean, that would, we want to know kind of what has happened with the pain and also we're going to be observing some of the findings. All right, we've got a great history going now. Um, and now it's time to get ready for the physical exam. So to do the physical exam for a thorax and lungs, you will be in different positions to do this, but it might very well be that you, um, maybe you're in a clinic situation. And in the clinic situation, you can have the person at, on, at the bedside or at the, on the clinic table. Um, sitting upright is a great way for you to observe, ob observe the chest, the, the back, um, the breathing effort, and also for you to be able to listen to lung sounds both in the front and in the back. And so you want to have good visibility. Now, the reality is, as nurses, you are going to be working in the hospital. So you may be, and you will be doing a physical um, assessment of the thorax and lungs with the person, the patient, lying down and so you still can do a good exam but if you and to listen to the back you've got to you have to listen to the back first of all and you want the person to sit up as much as possible um, it would be best for the person to be up and if it's a man they can disrobe to the waist a woman can leave the gown on and open at the back and so what you'll want to do is you'll want to drape her so that you can keep her her breasts covered so she'll feel more secure about that um, and giving her the feeling of, of, of comfort. It's also a good idea for you to have a quiet environment because you're going to be um, listening with your stethoscope and, and, and primarily for this you want to make sure the stethoscope is the right size but for adults we usually use a regular size stethoscope. I would think that for this exam the best thing is just to do use the larger part which is the diaphragm. Um, we don't use the bell usually with this exam um, but we will use it when we get to the cardiac section. So make sure that it's warm, the room is warm, the diaphragm piece is warm, and that you have no interruptions during that time. Um, it's not a bad idea also just to bring um, uh, alcohol wipes just to make sure your, your equipment is clean. Um, it goes on to a little bit of the OSHA information that you need. So just like all exams, I am going to inspect first. Um, and so uh, inspection. Now with the respiratory thorax and the thorax and, and lungs, 
you, you usually you look first, then you touch or palpate. If I'm an advanced practice nurse, sometimes I percuss as a possibility, and then you listen. Now, most of you as nursing, as nurses um, that are not advanced practice, probably the most things you'll be doing um, would be looking and possibly doing a little bit of palpation, um, but primarily looking and listening. You'll be asked to measure the anterior to posterior versus the transverse. Um, those are some of the things that you'll be asked to do and then of course to listen. So um, I am going to just kind of sh talk to you while I do this, but since this is a male, I can go ahead and if I get their permission and it's warm enough to just kind of expose the chest. So I am going to be looking first and you're visibly looking and tell them, you can even say, will you take a deep breath? So they take a deep breath and I'm looking to see what? What is the key word here? Well, the key word that you're inspecting for is symmetry. You wanna make sure that from right and left chest wall that they are symmetrically um, inspiration and expiration that there is, that is symmetrical, so that's important. I'm also looking at the back to just visibly see if I see any deformities. Um, so that's inspection. I'm also going to put my hands on this person. I'm inspecting again, but I'm putting my hands on them. So I'm going to say, yes, the anterior to posterior wall is less than the transverse wall, which would be across the chest wall. I can visibly see that. Now, another thing that you could do is I'm also observing not only the shape and configuration, I'm also looking to see, is this person's position of comfort sitting up or are they struggling? You can go into a room and you can say, man, this person can't sit up straight by themselves. They are in a tripod position and you have learned that a tripod position is a position of distress. Someone with COPD or someone with um, at bronchitis or emphysema, the, they may be most comfortable when they're leaning on a bedside table and that is called um, that is called the tripod position. So the position of comfort, I can look and say, my client is um, breathing, it's even, the breaths are even, he doesn't seem to be in distress, his position of comfort is relaxed, he has symmetrical inspiration and expiration. The skin color, um, is tan. I can see on this person it's tanned. Of course, he does have an incision here because of the mannequin, but um, I would look at his skin color also on his face because that is oxygenation as well um, and the condition of the chest. Now, what you can do is, and you've got slides about this, is you can palpate for symmetrical expansion. Um, that is another step that you could do. People can do it, usually what you do is that you are you can do it in the front, but usually people do it in the back. And so to do it in the back, what I would do is I would place my hands at the lower part of his ribs and I would have the client take a deep breath and I would watch my hands. Do they rise and fall symmetrically? And that would show me that the patient has symmetrical inspiration and expiration. That's what you're looking for. And that is called symmetrical expansion. Um, your PowerPoint mentions tactile frematis. And tactile frematis is where you have the person say something like 99, 99. You have them say something that will vibrate. And what you're basically doing, and this is part of palpation, is you're putting the ulnar side of your hand in between their ribs, and they say 99, 99. You can also go side to side, 99, 99, and probably better to go side by side. You expect vibrations. So when a person says 99, you don't want to be on bone, you want to be in the intercostal spaces, but what you're expecting is to feel vibration. And sometimes when you feel less vibration in certain places, that could be a sign that there may be some pneumonia there, or we call it consolidation or fluid. So your book talks about frematis, tactile frematis, or vocal frematis, which you say 99 or something else, is um, something that you would expect is a normal thing. You expect to feel vibration. Your book does talk about, on page 423, uh, by the way, on page 423 is a wonderful picture of what I was talking about as far as symmetric expansion. So tactile frematis, it's showing you how to do it more on the back side of the um, 
the back side of the, of the posterior chest wall versus the anterior. So I would suggest that that would be a, a good way to do it. Um, so again, it talks a little bit about what would be abnormal fremitus on page 424. And this is not um, usually tested for um, undergraduate nursing students as much as for us to know as nurse practitioners or advanced practice nurses. But when you do your exam in lab, you should test for fremitus and see if you can feel some vibrations that come through the chest wall. All right, we've inspected this chest wall and I've I've done the, if I had done my exam, I would have done some um, symmetrical expansion. I would have tested for fremitus. And now, if I were in advance, um, oh, the other thing that you can also palpate is palpate the whole chest wall for any kind of areas of tenderness or the temperature, that type of thing. Advanced practice nurses also percuss the chest wall. You are not, um, required to know this advanced technique, but it, it, it asks you to at least be able to percuss um, a sound in the lungs. And certainly, theoretically, you should know what that sound is. So there's two different kinds of percussion. And one of them, we talked about this with approaches earlier, but one of them is, is called indirect percussion. And that is where you tap short taps on a finger that's lying on a person's body. So if I were doing percussion in this on this model, I would be going in between and I would be percussing like that and I would go across and percuss again and then come down just like I was doing any other kind of exam. Now what I'm going to hear that's normal sound in the lungs. What's that called? the normal percussion sound in the lungs. It's called resonance. And it's, resonance is the normal sound. Resonance is the predominant note over the lung fields. And that's what you would expect. Now you can see um, a picture of um, how to do percussion on page 425. It also shows you in the back where the bones are. If you go over a bone, I'm, I'll do it on the table. You can't really hear it on a table. It sounds very dull if you do it over a bone. But if you go in between, like the, obviously this chest wall is hollow, doesn't have lungs in it. But usually that sound that you hear right now is it would be a little bit higher pitched and it's called resonance. Um, if a person, this is your book describes resonance as a low pitched clear, hollow sound that predominates in healthy lung tissue. So resonance, it's a great thing for you to know. Healthy lung tissue, low pitch, clear, hollow sound. Um, and again, resonance, sometimes how we, we would chart that is resonance predominates. If a person has hyper resonance, that would be um, a lower pitched. And it obviously, it, it's a sound that you would hear with emphysema or pneumothorax. Hyperresonance is a sign of air trapping. Um, and it also mentions in the pink column that I was telling you about here that if you have a uh, dull note, that could be pneumonia, that could be a tumor, like a lung tumor, or maybe something, a collapsed lung perhaps. Those would be reasons for it. So now we've done inspection. We've done um, inspection of the chest wall. We've done symmetrical excursion. Uh, we've palpated the chest wall to make sure there's no areas of tenderness. We've also um, done some fremitus, which was putting our hands on to do some fremitus check. And then we did some uh, listened for the predominant sign, which would be the resonance. Now it's time to do the auscultation. And this is what you're most used to as nursing students. But to auscultate, the lungs, of course, you need a stethoscope. And it, there's pretty much the pattern of auscultation, um, which starts on page 427. We're going to skip a diaphragmatic excursion because that's a higher level that I don't think you need to be involved with. But what you should know is that we do check the anterior and posterior chest wall for sounds. And what you, you've got, 
Um, it shows you the technique on page 427 um, as far as where to put your, your stethoscope on the back. And then it shows you um, on the back what sounds you would mostly hear on page 429. So I'll be referring to those as well. Um, so posterior chest, I think I could probably turn this guy around. But on the posterior chest, eek. Okay, so it, as you can see from your book, I, again, you've looked, so you're ready to listen. So without me listening, I'm just going to tell you that I'm going to start up here around the shoulders because your lung tissue does come up in this area. And the, one of the key things about um, auscultating lungs is that make sure that you do it side to side. And I kind of do a Z pattern. I go side to side. You actually, what you do is side to side, then down, and then over. So it's almost like a crisscross kind of Z pattern. You want to make sure that you've done a very thorough job in getting to all the areas that you're going to. So I, and I usually count, and I start on the left side so that when I finish, I'll finish the, and I do 10. You know, you can do, I think your, your, quali your requirement is to do six to eight, but if you're doing a really thorough job, you can see that they did about 10 here. So I basically go one and two, and then I come in because the scapula are here and I don't want to go over the spine. So you kind of come in for three and four, and then you come down for five and six. You continue down and you can look in your book by the time, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six. Then you're going to continue down and do seven and eight, and then I'm going to do nine down here. And by the time I get to 10, I'm going to be on the right side of the, of the patient's body. That number 10 being, if you start over here with one and you go down across and down, you'll finish with 10. Then that should remind you, I have one more spot I need to do on that right side. Remember, you have a middle lobe on the right side. So you ask your patient to please raise their arm. And then you're going to go mid-axillary line about the fourth or fifth intercostal space. And you're going to listen right there for that middle low. So that is the, the direction you take. And it's really perfectly OK as you're listening to press and feel, is that soft area or am I over bone? Because you want to be on soft area. So you tell the person, I need to listen to your lungs now. And every time I place my stethoscope, you take a deep breath in through your nose and out through your mouth slowly. And at any time you get um, shorter breath or need to take a break, let me know because you don't want them to pass out on you. So again, it's one and two, three and four. Then you come in by the spine, by the spine, five and six, seven and eight. Then after you've cleared the scapula, you can come down on the body. That's nine. And then you can come over here to 10 and you're on the lower lobes. Oh, I need to do one more underneath the arm. And then, so that is the posterior. And then you can go to the anterior chest wall. Now your book kind of separates the whole exam again, but I kind of showed you how I would have done anterior and posterior. So on the, ch on the front, and again, since this is a male, I would be okay if they're okay to expose their chest. But on, on the anterior, um, you're going to see it starts on page 431 about how to palpate the anterior chest. So you could actually have them take a deep breath again and see if you've got symmetrical, after you've looked at it, symmetrical expansion. Um, and then what you want to do is you want to, um, it shows you also where to tactile fremitus and where to percuss. So where are we going to listen to? Well, you're going to listen at, and remember, you don't have to go to, to the baby stuff, but you're going to listen starting up. I don't even see it in here. You're going to listen, first of all, I always start on the left side above the clavicle. So I'm going to listen here. That would be one spot. Take a deep breath. I'm going to go across and compare. That's two. Then I'm going to come down to about the second intercostal space. That's three. Then come over here. That's four. This is a male, so I can continue down straight on the chest. There's five. There's six. And then I'm going to go underneath the breast, seven, and on this side, eight, taking a deep breath. Now, if you, if you do just six, you'll have to just spread yourself out. But make sure, if you do six, that you've gone back and forth, 
mid chest and then underneath, but if you wanna go in between, you can. The most important thing is that you're listening for inspiration and expiration at every, at every site. You're listening for normal breath sounds, and I don't like that word normal, breath sounds because normal, my normal might be different than your normal. So another way of saying it is that there are no adventitious breath, breath sounds. The word adventitious would be rails, ronchi, wheezes, any, and you, when you're doing your write-ups, you should rule out adventitious sounds. So you can say, breath sounds are clear in all fields, anterior and posterior with vesicular that's the name of the breath sound, with vesicular breath sounds predominating. Um, we know that in healthy adults, you're gonna hear vesicular, and in the posterior, you're gonna hear vesicular in most of the outer lobes. When you get closer to the, to the um, sternum, you're gonna hear bronchovesicular towards the middle, and then bronchial up here by the neck. So there's three different kinds of breath sounds. Your book does a pretty good job of showing you those breath sounds, by the way, um, back on page uh, 429. It shows you how you can see they've got little Vs, and then they've got BVs for bronchial vesicular, and then the Bs for bronchial. So. You're, so what you're trying to do is listen, anterior and posterior. So the write-up would say something like, breath sounds are present and clear, anterior and posterior in all fields, with vesicular breath sounds predominating, no adventitious sounds, and then say what those adventitious sounds are. No crackles, no wheezes, no um, rails. Those would be the three that I would rule out. So remember, wheezes are the high-pitched musical sounds. Rails are more of a popping sound. Um, and then you do have ronchi, which is a harsher sound. So those are some of the things that you would be looking at with your exam. Um, I'm looking to see if there's anything else I want to tell you. The, um, it does talk a little bit about some pulmonary function tests that can be done for your client, um, but you generally will not be, be doing those, and so you can skip those. We do as nurses pulse oximetry, and that's part of our vital sign check now to make sure that our vital signs are, that's part of what we would test for is to make sure they have uh, good ox, uh, pulse ox. As you can see from the sample charting here, it talks about no coughing, shortness of breath, or chest pain with breathing. What is that? That's the subjective no history of respiratory disease, and then the patient would have stated one or two colds per year, has never smoked, works in a well-ventilated office, uh, smoking coworkers are restricted to smoking in lounge. Last TB skin test was four years ago, um, negative, um, let's see, and never had a, uh, a chest x-ray. So that's subjective. And remember, subjective data is what your patient tells you um, object of data is what you see. So you can see for this particular exam, it talks about inspection. AP is less than transverse respirations. R16 per minute, and I didn't tell you that while I'm looking, I would be, of course, counting that. They're relaxed and even. That means you go in, you go out. There's no shortness of breath or unevenness. Palpation, the chest expansion is symmetric. That's what we talked about. Tactile fremitus is equal bilaterally. So you Get used to using the words bilateral and symmetrical. No tenderness when I palpated. Um, no lumps or lesions. I forgot to tell you that. So I'm listening. I'm feeling for tenderness, lumps or lesions. Um, percussion is resonance, resonant to percussion over lung fields. Um, you do you do not have to put in the diaphragmatic excursion. And then it said vesicular breath sounds over lung fields. No adventitious sounds. And please add. What does that mean? No rails, no ronchi, no um, wheezes. And so that would be your objective. Now the rest of the, um, the slides that you have talk about some abnormalities. And um, what I like about Jarvis is it does a terrific job of going through the abnormalities. And you're not gonna be tested on all of them, but it's good for you to know as a nurse that you, that you can at least identify um, the barrel chest we talked about, which would be AP is equal to or greater than transverse, and there's a picture on it on page 440. And then we do have um, 
uh, different kinds of pectus. It's either a sunken in sternum or a uh, protruded sternum, which is excavatum versus carvanatum. Um, scoliosis is an S curve in the spine. We usually test for children that are pre-adolescent, but adults can have scoliosis as well. Um, kyphosis is a, a uh, it is a rounded um, uh, thoracic spine that sometimes happens with elderly people, um, and it can cause significant pain. And a lot of times, people that grow up with scoliosis also have kyphosis. So this is actually showing you some pictures that are also in your book. Um, you also have something that's abnormal findings as far as respiratory patterns, and a, your book again goes really great through these chapter. 18 talks about each one of these, so I would like you to look them up. Um, the one that that might be different that you've never heard of is the Byatt's respiration, and um, your book talks about it. It says that it's similar to chain stokes, except the pattern is irregular. So chain stokes is where you have a um, different, uh, it's almost like periods of apnea. You have waxing and waning, regular pattern. Um, and then it has periods where it stops. Um, so with Byatt's respiration, it's kind of the same, except it's not a regular, um, it's not as regular as chain stokes. Uh, they talk about that as seen with head trauma, brain abscess, et cetera. So I'll let you look at that. Um, there are some issues about tactile fremitus. It's a little bit of an advanced practice, not probably as important for you to note. And then here are the definitions of your adventitious sounds. Um, so I would particularly like you to look at the chart on page 444, which is talking about your adventitious sounds. You need to know these as nurses um, about crackles. There's fine crackles and coarse crackles. Um, there's also something called wheezes. And then there's, you know, they have something about wheezes. They talk about strider as well. Um, so look those things over. You... Um, have some common respiratory conditions and it continues you can see also um, what can happen when the lung collapses i like your pictures in um, that start on page 447 it just shows you what are some of the conditions and what can happen to the lungs when these conditions happen so at least get an idea of each one of these what can happen when you have this condition uh, there's a couple questions in the back here, but um, one's on tactile fremitus and one is on uh, greater activity of a six minute walk. And I think both of those questions are not very significant in, in, in our discussion because they have to do with more advanced practice. So I hope that this um, presentation and demonstration will help you as you complete your th thorax and lung um, lab. and. Um, if you have any questions, of course, contact your faculty or your or e either through email or discussion. Thank you very much.